Sid. Hi, Mike. We've got to stop meeting like this. <laughs> it, it strikes me over the years, we've met in some strange places, but this one I think takes the biscuit. biscuit. How are well, you? I look, I'm, I'm fine, thanks. And I look forward to seeing you in the flesh next time. But uh, meanwhile, th this is great fun. Tremendous. Tremendous. How do we get into all this, Sid? Um, well, for some reason, I'd gone to Uppingham. I think I'd met um, a mutual friend who a lovely lady who lives in Beebe. And she asked, uh, she asked me if I ever found a cable drum. And uh, one, one Sunday at the coast, I was packing the van up to go back to Mid Wales. And I virtually finished packing the van and Joe came up to me and said, you never guess what I've just seen. And I said, don't tell me, not a, cable drum and she said yes and this particular lady has been wonderfully uh, supportive to you and to me so we went and the tide was coming in and we had to dig this thing out I actually tore ligaments in both arms doing it I never told her um, this this thing was a full-size cable drum we dug it out having then got it out I had to roll it through the main street of the village, stopping the traffic and repacking the van. And I had delivered it to her in BB. And I met J and M with Holly as a tiny baby in a cafe in Uppingham. And they suggested that I come along to the gallery. And I like to think that Uppingham is, is I washed up on the seashore of Uppingham and you came out as a beachcomber, as I would have done. And you saw me and you put me in your pending tray and you thought, well, it's another oddity, but he might, he might fit in at some point. And it, it was brilliant because when I met you, you know, it was, it was such an amazing place for me to land. And there was no, you'll have to make an appointment or you'll have to submit some samples. Everybody in that gallery was so welcoming. And uh, that's how we met. And you asked me to keep in contact. And I did. And um, it was actually 10 years later, you, you gave me a show. And it, it, if I'm not monopolizing this, which well, I know I am. Right? So you are absolutely <laughs> monopolizing it. Well, I'll give you a go in a minute. You, you, you not only then gave me a show, but you sent Jay and um, Mark came down and without seeing anything, without coming to the studio, you said you'd take everything. And you took, actually, I've, I've sorted it this morning, 92 pieces of work. Did we? Did we? Unbelievable. You can't have them can't back. Have them back <laughs> <laughs> I haven't got room, mate. <laughs> I think I think we've sold them. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, that enabled me to live full time as a as a beachcomber artist, and you know I'd always wanted to live like that. When I was eighteen, I, I found the works of Matsuo Basho, this poet tramp, and. I, I, that was my creed. That confirmed how I wanted to live. And you enabled me and my family to live like that. So, you know, thank you, mate. Shall we just, shall we just have a look at a piece, Sid? I've got the bit here. Let me, let me just uh, show you this. You don't want to get near the business end. Well, is that the business end? Or is, is, that, the bus is that the business no. end? Which is the business <laughs> no. end, Sid? The blue and green bit is the fun bit. The business end is that sting. Is it? Have we, have we got a tiny bit of film of this one that we can just play while Sid and I are looking at it?
I don't know whether we've got the technology. Spring Sting Hornet. Talk, talk to me about that. I'll talk to you about that. I had that body yeah. in in my in my studio. It, it's I love working with burnt pieces. If we can rescue a burnt piece of material, um, and and over time, the drying out emphasised the grain. So I've got this fabulous piece of wood, and it wasn't until I then found the the blue green bit, which I picked that up off the beach, and Joe said that's the top of a drinking uh, can or container or whatever. And I I had an idea. My spatial awareness is quite good. Uh, I had an idea that it might fit that piece of wood or be compatible with that piece of wood. And having done that. You know, I've been reading about insects and what a very tough time they're having. Um, and we need them. Uh, that, that I then wanted to, I think I've made uh, about four. I like to have little series of things. So that's, that's one of my insect range. And then, of course, I had that sting in my um, Sid scrapyard tray and that completed that completed the piece for me with its six legs, yeah. Here's the, Sid, here's the extraordinary thing that I find about you and what you do. And, and that is, you don't cut and you don't carve and you don't color. You just see these odd bits of pieces that any of the rest of us would walk past and somehow you assemble them and when you've done it we look at it and that was it who was the poet who talked about the willing suspension of disbelief which constitutes poetic faith that I seem to remember from my about 60 years ago when I was doing that sort of thing was it it was who was that it, it was Mr. Coleridge. It was Coleridge. Coleridge. And that's what you do. This ability to take something which the rest of us would walk past and then put it together and we look at it and we see a bird or an insect or a man or whatever and it's there with its personality and then if we take it a bit again we dissemble it it goes back to these three or four meaningless bits of detritus that the rest of us would walk past and it's an extraordinary ability that you've got how do you do it you've got well, you've got 30 seconds to give us an answer <laughs> well, I think without wishing to sound, uh, you know, pretentious or... or go, on, go on, Sid, sound pretentious. Uh, well, you know, the, the writing of Matsuo Basho, when, when he went, he just went for a walk. And it, it, there was a spirituality about what he saw whatever it was, whether it was his new pair of rope sandals or his paper coat, uh, he would then write a haiku piece, 17 syllables, uh, describing beautifully that sight and sense of belonging to that place. So, I've I was so knocked out. I was I'd been sleeping rough along the North Cornish coast. Uh, it, 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 I did I did that whenever I could and and, and other places um, in the sixties. And and when you find somebody who writes like that, and you can apply that to the way you look at the world, when I hit the beach or a field or a hedgerow. I don't just keep walking. You have to stop and absorb and and listen and smell and take it all in. And once you have realized 
the um, you, where you're placed in that scene, uh, how insignificant you are, you 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 start to see things and you start to feel things, and I've just always loved found objects. I, I, I think I sent into the gallery recently a photograph that I found um, from 1949. I, I don't, I was born in 48 in Brighton and I'm on Brighton Beach, 1949, plaintively, uh, you know, holding up a pebble or a shell, spellbound. I mean, and, and that has never left me. I've been picking things up for, for seven decades now and I'm still spellbound. Sid, sh show some, show me a recent piece that you've. Have you got something near you in the studio that you've recently put together that we could have a look at? Yeah, I've got um, Lee Durrell, who uh, from from you Jersey. Got, Sid, Sid, you haven't got Lee Durrell in your studio, have you? Could you come out, Lee? I'm sorry, she's still in makeup. Um, we don't have Lee to. Sid, Sid we, don't, yeah. we don't have to pay extra for Lee Durrell on the set, do we? <laughs> Lee Durrell is wonderful. And when she heard about Louis' passion, um, and you have to bear in mind, I'm going to turn the clock back a little bit, because there are three of us here working. Sid, Sid let me stop you for a moment. You and I know who Lee Durrell is. Yeah. It's rumoured that there is one other person watching this. So can you explain... <laughs> Who whose wife Lee Durrell was? Well, well, doc, Dr. Lee Durrell is the widow of the late great Gerald Durrell, um, a wonderful conservationist. Uh, sadly, sadly, no longer with us. And Lee runs is the honorary director of of Jersey Zoo. And Lee heard about Louis' passion for wildlife. And the fact that when he was, I think he was six or seven, he he seen a documentary by David Attenborough, and he stood up and and he said, well, "I may be small, but I'm determined to make a difference." That's so. That's, he, that's your son, Louis. That's our son, Louis. Yes. Who yes. who who is still studying to be to save the planet, and uh, he he was invited by Lee to go to Jersey, and. We've had a great uh, association since since then. That's since two thousand and two, three. Um, so I made uh, once, and we've been several times to, to see Lee and and to go to the zoo. And they have the most wonderful collection of animals. They have breeding in captivity programs whereby they can they they bring animals back from the brink of distinction. And one of the animals there is. Uh, the giant jumping rat, and Lee very kindly helped me name this piece, uh, the Madagascar term would be Vositsu, and um, this, I hope you can see it, I, I found this head, <laughs> um, and it's got this fantastic rodent's teeth, can you see? And it still has a little seed jammed within its teeth. So uh, I have one piece of wood that would accept this plastic head. And um, Sid, do, yeah. Sid, do me a favour. Hold it still. Yeah. In, hold it still in front of the, the the camera, so we can really take a good look at it. That's extraordinary. Can you can you see that? Yes. Yes, can you can you turn it slowly? Oh, I've only got little arms. That's amazing. And I tell you what, that tail. Yeah. Hang on. What's it called again? Well, it's the Malagasy giant jumping rat, but Lee tells me Vusitsu in, Ma in, in Madagascar. And look, can you see the tail? Yes. And that just sits in a hole that was already in the bit of wood. 
Amazing. Um, so that's a recent one. Show me one more. And will you show me another one? I will, I will. Um, there was a very famous entomologist, uh, Herr Brush, who studied, he was head of entomology at the University Sid, of Clue. Sid you've, Sid, you've just made that up, haven't you? Uh, you, you know me well. Hair brush. You know me well. Hair brush. B-R-U-S-C-H. Uh, -R -R oh, yes. And was head of entomology yes. at, at the University of Cluj in Transylvania. Yes. And although he was a big man... You are making he, up, Sid. He liked caving. Of course. And he, he discovered, he discovered Herr Brush's lizard. Go on, let's see it. And... It's virtually sightless, <laughs> um, but it can detect it can detect other animals around it through the bristles on its back. Have you, by chance, got Herr Bruce's address so that when we get it in the gallery, we can offer it to him? You, can... you won't be able to resist it, will he? <laughs> <laughs> It's got a little miniature spring tail, a bit yes. like it's yes. uh, relative, of course. Yes. Um, yes. So, so, so there we are. Um, I was, I could show you a third piece that I'm in the process of working on. Can you squeeze that in? Yeah, but tell me, tell me first, because I think, I mean, I know the answer to this, but I'm sure that if there is anybody watching this, they, they might be um in a way as astounded as i was when i first found out that actually sometimes it can take a decade before you unite the two or three pieces that are going to make one of these birds or animals or whatever well absolutely absolutely i mean we we started collecting seriously we we Joe introduced me to uh, part of West Wales where three rivers come out, brilliant place, brilliant beaches, constant milling of material. And that was in 1998, we bought an, an old mobile home and it, it was just magic. Um, and that's when I actually, it struck me, it's all very well collecting driftwood, pebbles, things that you find attractive, but you've got to do something with them. And if you can, if you can see narrative in, in one or two or three pieces of material um, and, and show people and share that fun, and it, it's a reminder of the natural world. And that, you know, I mean, that is just, just so spellbinding. But yeah, I've, I've got a piece of wood in, in the studio that Joe noticed jammed in some rocks. And she came home and she said, you've got to come, you've got to come down at low tide. I'll take you to where these rocks are and you see this piece of wood. You're going to go mad. And sure enough, it, it was fantastic. Uh, and we had to wait till the low tide. And Joe crawled in amongst the rocks and she started trying to push this piece out i'm outside the rocks on the beach scraping away trying to pull and there aren't many wives that will crack ribs in order to rescue a piece of material uh, and without joe and her carrying capabilities and her fantastic support we wouldn't have all the material we have to work with Having said that, we get this piece of wood out and it turns out to be a railway sleeper. <laughs> and I've then got to carry it a quarter of a mile because the fact that she's cracked ribs <laughs> and worked, worked her socks off, we can't lose it. So that's in the studio. That's been here about 20 years. So, yeah. Yeah, well, you've got to, you, you know... With maturity, 
comes patience, perhaps. But the other point is, all this material, it isn't rare. It is unique. And if I blow it, if I, if I, if I don't get it right, I've, got, I've, I've lost that piece of material. And that, that would be just devastating because this is my currency. I, I hear people talking about wealth management. Wealth management, you know, I, I, I don't like the sound of that. This is wealth management. I'm sat here in what should be the dining room. We've never eaten a sandwich in this room because it's, it is floor to ceiling with Sid Salvage. So I've got to show you one more piece. I've got to show you one more piece. Go on, I, I, listen, uh, we'll look at one more piece in a moment. But before we do that, through the wonders of modern technology, which I don't understand at all, I've just had a question. There is actually one person watching this and i have to tell you um i don't know how all it, right? i don't know how it works Sid, but it's david in somerset do you know a david in somerset because I, I don't i'm not i'm not very good with names but i don't i don't recall david in somerset no, me neither but david in somerset says love your work sid how is the beach combing working during lockdown well, do we want to let him know, or should we just get on with what we're doing? Well, I, I'll tell him briefly. You got some good cider down there, mate. Um, I haven't been to the beach for a while, but the last time we went, we went to the Gower, which was is 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 only about sixty miles from here, and I got a cracking bird body. He used to captain England, didn't he? <laughs> show us that. Show us that other piece that you were going to uh, show us that other that that last piece. Well, this this I went to stay with my old mate Ken in Bristol for a yeah. fortnight. Uh, while his Ken is about one hundred and twenty now, isn't he? <laughs> He's ninety eight, and he lives he lives alone in a five story house in Bristol, Extra and his regular. His regular helper, his girl Friday, as he calls her, yep. she gone to Australia, I think, for respite. <laughs> so I went to look after Ken. Yeah. And I tell you what, mate, when I got home, I couldn't speak for a week. I was so stressed out. But <laughs> well, so, I, so I, I think we've got about two minutes left of this broadcast. So we're going to have to turn it into a series, I think. But just show me this, this other piece that you were going to. I'm pleased as a series because I haven't finished it yet. I, while I was with Ken, I used to go shopping as much as I could, two or three times a day, just to get out. And Bristol is a skip rich, rich city. And I found on I found on a corner of a street, some student, I guess, had moved on, and I found this. And I had to say. My son I Jay thought, would know what that was. I thought of Jay because, Absolutely. look, watch. Go on. Oh, I've got time. This is this is tricky. You got to bear, bear in mind my age and. Um, bear in mind your what? Age. Age. My age. You're I'm, a I'm, I'm old. And, Sid. I'm old and tiny. We can forget about Ken. <laughs> can you see that? Yeah. I think it's a, I think it's a football. So it was going to become part of a musical arrangement, but yeah. then I thought, no, that I am going to make that, and I'm going to name it after you. It's going to become a microphone. Oh God! So I'll, I'll show you how I get on on episode two. Can we just? Um, if we if we can manage the technology, can we just put up one of the pieces we've got here from a previous film so that... Uh, yeah. Which one do you want to put up, Johnny? I don't mind. Someone's prompting me here, Sid, just a moment. Yeah. The Professor. The Professor is behind you. He's behind me. Behind you. Well, look to your right. What do you think? Is this some sort of musical? 
<laughs> Go on. Well, I can tell you about the professor. Yes. And can we put it up so that people can see it, or do I do I need to hold it? I've got to hold it. It's behind you, to your right. The scissors. Yeah. That that's that's fine. That is that is only the second pair of scissors that I have found in seven decades. And I just love the fact that it again I had that piece of driftwood like a cheese. But if you it was wide enough to accept the scissors so that they became spectacles or big eyes, and and the cutting part became a nose or beak. And even the crack in the wood, which was there, suggests that the professor is nodded off. And, and the, the remains of the brush, I think when he had a full head of hair, he obviously had a centre parting. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> that's how the professor was born. The other important thing to say is I wasn't sure what to call that. And I was with Max and Emma in, in the gallery. And it was Emma that said it looks professorial. So it's thanks to Emma, <laughs> thanks to Emma that it has that name. Sid, it's been great chatting, even under these strange circumstances. And I, I, I have a feeling we should definitely do it again. Um, do you remember we made, first time round, we made a film about you? Yes. And we almost won a prize with the film. I think we were, run, we were runner up to something. Uh, we were runner up with another of our films, but this, this time to the BBC, I think that was last week or the week before, but we made a super film about you. And if the um, David from Somerset, who's the only person watching this, if, <laughs> if he, if he wants a bit more pleasure, I think that um, through this wonderful technology, we're going to play that film now for, for people to watch. It's been great chatting with you, Sid. And we'll do this again shortly. Thank you, Mike. And thank you, everybody at the gallery. Ciao. Bye-bye. Ciao. Bye-bye. place was going up in smoke, God forbid. This is my treasure. Now when we're beachcombing, these are the sorts of things we might pick up. There are things like this chap. That's a beautiful head, you know. Look at that. Fabulous. Wonderful knot. Wonderful eye. Look at that. 
That's a kind eye. That's not quite as kind, but it's still pretty good. This is my absolute treasure chest here. Not many people get to see this. This interests me because it's got, it's a sort of drawing of a bird's head that you might get in Native American Indian folklore. Um, I love the names of American cars from the, from the 50s and 60s, Pontiac, Thunderbird, Chevrolet. They're great, great names, but I can imagine that, you know, Pontiac Chieftain or something like that. That's got, that's got such power, this proud brow, and the, it's got a very defiant eye. I love Inuit art. That's, those people have nothing. The hardest, harshest life they lead, and they can produce a creature from one piece of bone or horn. And, you know, to achieve that, that's, that piece of material is, is, fires my imagination, makes, makes me appreciate that, that sort of work and makes me strive. I think that's fabulous. And my big responsibility, as I say, is not spoiling any of this, you know. I've got to... I've got to show it absolutely to the, the best, more than the best of my ability to preserve and to share it with somebody else. That's, that's a burnt piece, but it's majestic, that. That is absolutely fantastic. That beak. Perhaps he's chewing on something that side, I don't know. Or maybe he needs to go to the dentist, he's got an abscess. Anyway, I still think it's great, it's powerful. That, Slightly raised up like that. That gives, that's attitude. That's the other thing. I don't understand about the science of birds. I don't understand, you know, that aspect. It's posture, attitude, behavior, coping with the elements, communication. That's, that's what I'm interested in. We get to the coast every, every three weeks and then we are diligent. I'm on that beach first thing for breakfast and I have to have my breakfast otherwise I'm, I've only got a little engine so if I don't stoke it I'm in trouble. And I don't mind whether the weather's rough, that doesn't bother me. When it's wet it, it is more difficult because co colours and textures don't stand out. Everything kind of goes a dark grey or if not black. Your glasses get splashed. The wind makes your eyes water, so your tears run. You know, Picasso said, you, you cannot look, you have to just find. That's okay, that, that's, that's fine, but I don't paint, so <laughs> sod Picasso, I'm going to go and look as well. <laughs> Help! <laughs> There's his hand waving <laughs> at the bottom of that pool <laughs> and it looked really frightening. <laughs> Davy Jones locker. <laughs> oh mate. I suppose they're that way around, aren't they? In the caves. 30,000 years old, that is. Here the oyster catchers. Getting ready for supper. Humour's always played a big part in what I do. And Quite a lot of my boats have sold, sailed off into the distance, but one that I kept 
was the Lusitania. And um, as the very knowledgeable Mr. Sam Llewellyn says, this is the closest I get to Marcel Duchamp and his urinal. This is my half a wooden lavatory seat. And this is a bit of sheep's wool from Radnor Valley. Getting the engine going. Toot toot. So there we are, that's the Lusitania. I think this is a fabulous bird. I've had this bird for years. And um, it has got the most wonderful head. When, and when I say things like wonderful and beautiful and fabulous, it's not what I've done, it's what, as I think of my work as a celebration, a celebration of what the natural elements do to man-made and organic material. It is fabulous, look at this. Wings, tail feathers, very uplifting. I really love that piece. I think that's fantastic. And not what I've done, what the sea's done. Okay. Oh, look at this. Wow. Goodness me. That, I think, that may become yeah, if I can put a, that round the neck of a bird and then a, the head, you know, they have rough, some of these birds, especially the, I mean, the birds of paradise, fantastic. And that is the other thing, that's the main thing about what I do, you know, nature does the most extraordinary things. I can't do anything too unlikely because nature has already done it. And a blooming sight better than anything I can come up with. But there you are, inspiration. What's that, another fantastic piece? Oh, I can see a bird there, hunched. Yeah, head there, feet, yeah. Yeah, you wouldn't want to cross that one when I finished. Look at this, some sort of courtship display. That's fabulous. Wow. Wish I'd had hair like that <laughs> when I was a teenager. <laughs> oh, great. This is my treasure. This is what my grandmother taught me, you know. Look, there I am, not one years old. And she would say, look for a bit of pencil, ducky. And so, because I used to look for bits of pencils, I mean, I had hundreds of little bits of pencil, but she was teaching me to use my eyes and, uh, and to be imaginative and, yeah. So, oh, I always had boxes of, you know, little skulls and that's what, look at those bird skulls up there. I look at those and I think, God, what elements did those creatures survive in. What did they see? Wow, fabulous. No, this is, you know, I'm not wealthy, but there's nobody richer than me. I love all these um, little cameos you're getting of wildlife, because that's what glues our time here together. We're just tiny bit players in this active out daily life of all these wild creatures. All this is a gift. So, you know, we know that provided we wake up every morning it's here at rain or shine. But just to come and prove to yourself that it's still all here. It's just absolutely magical. So it's a sense of being alive, being a free spirit, and feeling, you know, how, how lucky we are. You only need to take a little tiny part of it and you've got, you've got pleasure and entertainment 
hours. And look at it all. How can you do it justice? It's fantastic. I pinch myself that, you know, I'm going to wake, not wake up and it's all been a dream. It's just all the time, that wonderful, soothing sound. Sun sparkling on the water. Wonderful. If I was going to save two boxes, I had to, for some reason, leave the building once and for all. I would have to take, these are my bird heads, which represent 10 years beach combing. And these are, are bodies which are absolutely, to me, exceptional. And I'm very, very slow to commit to a composition. I can come over here any evening and offer a head to a body and, and it would work. It's a nice little head, very simple, eye both sides. But is that the very best? And I've got to be seriously convinced that I am giving that material the very best of my attention. Otherwise, I won't commit to it. Because, believe me, this is serious treasure. Serious currency, folks. Here's a bit of wood. I would have been able to use that at one time. Well, this is an example of what I might almost have used. Sid hurtles into the 21st century. Hello? Hello? Mr. Obama? I'm really busy. Yes. Well, I'm pleased your economy is making a bit of a comeback, but we are seriously busy here, beachcombing and recording our humble activities. So I'll make sure you're invited to the show. Yep. Many thanks for calling. And you. Bye. President Obama. Amazing. Technology. I wish he wouldn't call when I'm not in the office. Right. This is an example uh, of what I might have used because it's got a good eye definition, but it's, it's too crude and it almost, almost is as much of a challenge what, I, what you don't use as what you use because you've got to keep improving and improving not just your own imagination but the quality of the material. Uh, it sounds terribly heartless to throw a piece of, of beautiful wood away that's sea-worn like that but I'm sorry it's not up to standard but I wanted you to see you know if that hadn't broken off it's pleasantly rounded you can see it on a big bird maybe it's just not good enough so there we are, we'll leave it for Neptune to pick up when the tide comes in. I used to be sort of horrified finding the remains of fires on the beach because very often the material that was left was, was A, useless, but B, uh, totally unsightly and poisonous to the environment. But I've, I've learnt to salvage burnt material and, and I use these pieces 
in my pictures. I'm not a colorist, but I can see the fabulous colors and textures and shapes that evolve through the destructive force of a fire and litter. So if I can turn that into something interesting, uh, that's wonderful, that gives me a real buzz. When you see a boiling sea and crashing against rocks and things, look, this is a miniature version. Fantastic. Look at that. That is the remains of a flip-flop. A colour. So what I might have to do is a picture involving a coral, the, the Great Barrier Reef maybe, <laughs> in West Wales plastic. Great. I like a challenge. <laughs> This is quite an old one, but I think it's the shaft, the metal shaft from a spade. And it had these, had these eyes, and I, so I call that El Toro. You know, you see those posters, uh, they're always red and yellow, encouraging you to go to Spain. And the bulls, they're always leaning forward and pawing, clouds of dust snorting. Look at his, I can hear that one. Terrifying. <laughs> and if you want to get really scary, there's these two characters. I don't know whether they should go together or what. I'll make you a bit of space first of all. This is called the big fight. Uh. In the red corner, the champion. <laughs> Don't know what his name is. <laughs> oh, there's a funny one. Got to look at them both sides because some are happy, some are sad, some are defiant. A lot of birds have most extraordinary combs and plumes and like the hornbill. I mean, look at that piece of wood. I had to use that piece of wood, hadn't I? You know, look at that. What a fabulous piece of wood. I've been a bit serious, so now I'm gonna be a bit dark. This is the yellow booted dumbstruck. <laughs> You're allowed to laugh. I do think of myself as a, amongst other things, a cross between a dating agency and a scrap man, so. So we beachcomb mainly on the west coast of Wales and a particular shoreline that we work at, middle of Cardigan Bay. And at low tide, the remains of an ancient forest emerged, oak, birch, alder. And um, it's quite fantastic. You, you see these wonderful shapes stick up. Seven or eight years ago, this piece of wood washed up and it, it was drying out here for about three years. You can't rush drying out. Things split, fracture, just disintegrate. And I'm so pleased that this, this managed to stay intact. I think what's left of hundreds and hundreds of years of wear. I saw a film of Capercaillie's courting and uh, they're very important. The male's terribly important, typical male. Little legs, throw their heads back, chest out, strut, the whole business. And I thought, that's my, that's my piece of wood. And, um, and then I found this very, very slender head. It had a hole in. Uh, so 
I simply introduced the pebble. So there we are, courtship display. I can't think of anything more pleasurable than to go for a walk with my wife and son and be open to what the tide has delivered. And if through that work, it's hard to call it work because it's such a pleasure, if through that activity, shall we say, I can cause people to smile and laugh, be moved, and bring about that connection with, with the real world, the wild world and, and nature, then, then that's my reward, then I'm happy. That's, can't ask for much more than that. And then I come back and do it again, which is even better. So for me, I mean, it's a bit blowy today, but you get in the dunes and get your head down. Before long, you've drifted off, wake up to bird song or hunger, but well, that's a good thing. Healthy appetite brings you, really brings you alive. Absolutely. Like nothing else. Yeah. So, this is my place. Wonderful. to uh, educate, entertain our customers. Okay, so now we're going to look at some other of his prints. We're thinking very seriously about stopping making pots. It was nothing forced. And I think his jugs are, are really the epitome of that. Hello, welcome to today's broadcast from the Goldmark Gallery. One of my most regular places to visit up in this part of the world is the Goldmark Gallery. 